Yes, thank you for the slow clap. I love the slow clap. <laughs> hey, can uh, why don't we fill up this front? Because uh, I'm a, there's a lot of distance between me and you. So anyone that wants to come and sit on the ground, just come on down here. Especially you guys over here. Just come on down. Sit on the ground right uh, right here in the right here in the front. Just come on down. There you go. Run on down here. There you go. <laughs> there's no need to be that far away. Anyone else? You guys on the bleachers, you're welcome to come down here if you like, sit on the ground. Oh, praise Jesus. I'll let everybody get situated. I always tend to do that. I always tend to resituate the room a little bit, then I'm going to wait for a second. How's everybody doing today? Man, I heard Mike, Mike dropped it last night. How many of you guys got touched by Mike's message last night? That was, that was killer. Uh, Dave this morning, Laura Hackett bringing the worship this morning, and Marcus just now. God is so good. <laughs> and all the time, God is good. Amen. All right, hey, let's pray. Holy Spirit, we invite you into this room right now. We ask that you would come in power and touch our hearts. Father, I ask for a spirit of wisdom and revelation to touch us in this room right now. Oh, I'm feeling it up here. Holy Spirit, come and touch our hearts with revelation of your Son. I pray, God, that we would know your love, which passes all knowledge, yet you've given it to us. Thank you, Jesus, for your love. Thank you, Father, that you've taken a weak and broken man like me, and you've made me alive on the inside through your mercy and grace. Thank you, Jesus. You've been so good to us, God. Touch us this afternoon. In your name, amen. Well, for those of you who don't know who I am, my name is Zach Kinsley. I, uh, I, uh, uh, among other things, I'm also the director of our Awakening Teen Camp, which is why it sounds like I have fans. Um, <laughs> So, uh, but I have been here on staff at the International House of Prayer for about nine years, uh, going on nine years now. It's been a long time. Um, it's been a really good time. This has been a long time. Uh, six years of those, six of those years were spent on the night watch from midnight to 6 a.m. Some of the sweetest times of my life. I got to sit in the night watch from midnight to 6 a.m., gaze on the beauty of God with no distractions except my own that I eventually got over. And uh, <laughs> got to learn to love Jesus. I have been on a 28-year journey to cultivating a heart that loves nothing but God and hates nothing but sin. I have been a believer my entire life. Uh, though I've had many stumblings and struggles, for the most part, I can say for 28 years, I have given my life to God to the best of my ability. When I was 13 and 14, I uh, had made a commitment to pray for my friends and family members and those that I went to school with. And uh, I got on fire in 1997, 96, 97, 98, kind of a couple different conferences with Lou Engle, actually, believe it or not, old Papa Lou. He, uh, I, I went to a couple, there, there were these conferences called Prayer Quake in Arizona, and uh, then there were some, uh, there was another conference called Rock the Nations in 98. And throughout some of those journeys of going to different conferences, I decided to set my life to gaze at the beauty of God, to tithe my teenage years and give my life to God and pursue Him with fasting and prayer and see what would happen. And over the course of my high school career, I uh, gave myself to praying and fasting. 
Uh, I had a whiteboard in my room that I would write down the names of my friends and family members on it. And I would not write down the names of the kids in my school that I wanted to see saved. And I, would, uh, I had a, a whiteboard that, in my room with their names on it. And then I had a map of India because I felt called the, Ind- the nation of India. And so I would pray for the names on the wall. And then I would pray for India, specifically the state of Punjab, because that's where I felt called to uh, at 14, 15. So... I I did that on a consistent basis, and I could say with a good testimony that throughout the years, I saw 80% at least of those names I had put on that whiteboard either give their lives to God or start coming to church or something happened in their life, life, something happened in their heart. And uh, I have been around through lots over the years where I've gotten to see God move up until even this last year. With the awakening services here at IHOP, where I have gotten to watch not only myself, but my friends, myself, my own personal heart, and the hearts of my friends completely transformed as God has come into our midst and awakened us to who we are. And that's what I want to talk about today, actually. Specifically today, I want to talk about what is truth, what is real, and what is not real. And this is a question that many in our generation at this point are struggling with. What is real and what is not real? I am here to tell you that after 28 years of seeking the Lord, I have only one conclusion that there is a God and He has a desire for your heart. There is a God and He has a desire for my life. Amen? I know that sounds like a simple reality, but let me tell you, for 28 years, I've been struggling over that reality. Is God real? How many of you guys know what I'm talking about? It's one thing when you sit up here at the worship service and the emotion is perfect, the preaching is awesome, God is moving, and you go, man, he is so real. God is so real. I'm going to give my life to him. But the question that most of you are facing in the back of your mind is not do you believe God is real today? Because most of you, we're probably in a good swirl right now. How many of you believe God is real right now? We're not doubting God right now because this is a good swirl. We got worship going on. Tonight we've got uh, the awakening service. I know that many are going to experience the Holy Spirit firsthand. We got a good swirl going on. But what happens in October? What happens in November when you're at school and you made it for two months, but then your friends start to get at you? Their opinions and their comments start to strike your heart in ways that aren't helpful. You start to realize, well, okay, I believe, man, I went to Kansas City at that Fascinate conference and I lifted my hands and I said, I'm in. I want to see impact on my high school. I want to see impact in my city. And I want to love Jesus. I want to know who he is. I want to know his heart, his thoughts, and his affections towards me. But for some reason, four months later, five months later, I can't even begin to think why I even thought that was a good idea. Because right now, the only thing I'm dealing with is the fact that my friends don't like me. And my family thinks I'm weird. And I'm just tired. And I would rather just go to a movie and hang out with some friends and maybe get a girlfriend amen how many of you guys have been there before it's okay to be you can be honest (laughs) my high school career was filled with this as I was praying backstage I was asking God what to talk about today I have seven pages of notes I'm not sure if I'll go through them or not but I was asking if God I, I actually prepared but then I was like God what is on your heart and I just for for as soon as I asked that question during worship, it struck me. I want to tell you the thing someone, I wish someone would have told me when I was your age. Because I went to Rock the Nations in 1998, and Mike was there, Lou Engel was there, Dave Perkins, some amazing men and women of God. And they called us to fasting and prayer, and they gave us some of the most amazing messages on who God was. But my struggle wasn't what I thought about during those messages. My struggle was what I did in November and December when I went home. Amen? How many of you guys know what I'm talking about? Because here's what had happened when I'd go home. 
I would hear the message and I'd say, you know what? This is true. We only have like 80 years left on the planet. I've got to give myself to seeking out God, seeking out the word. I've got to plow as hard as I can to get to know him because that's because this sounds right. I, I agree 100%. I'll go to the altar call. I'll give my life to God. I'll plant my face in the carpet and I'll, and I'll make sure that nothing else can take away the fire that is lit inside of me. I'm going to make sure this flame lasts. Then I would go home, and my friends who had not gone to any of the conferences or known anything about what had happened to me, I felt like a new person. I interact with them. I'm like, no, you don't understand. I'm a different person than when you met me two months ago. I'm completely different. I'm transformed on the inside. I'm a different human being. And then we go, Zach, listen, that's great, but you need to calm down. My friends at church would say, Zach, you're a little too intense for us. You don't want to go to movies ever. You don't, want to, you don't ever want to hang out and talk. You're a little too intense for us, Zach. And I go, no, I, I'm not being intense. I'm just, this is what Christianity is, right? And they go, no, 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 no. You need to calm down. Let's go to laser tag on Thursday. Now, there's nothing wrong with laser tag. <laughs> I like laser tag. Let's go to laser tag on Thursday, and you know what? Let's not bring up your excited about the ravished heart of God over your life stuff. Let's just not bring that up. And I'd be like, okay, okay, so maybe that's what I'm supposed to do. I'll just dial it down a little bit. Then I would go to my high school, and we would do dramas for, G like evangelistic dramas on campus. And uh, we, would, uh, we, would, we would do human videos. They were really cheesy, but God loves it. They were, <laughs> we, uh, you know that, it was, because this is like 97, you know, DC Talk's Jesus Freak had been a popular song. Where's DC Talk at? Yeah. DC Talk Jesus Freak had been a popular song, and we had done a choreography. We called it a human video where we would uh, act out different scenes from the song. And at the end of the day, it was supposed to be like an evangelistic thing. They were supposed to say, like, Jesus is real. And then somebody would come forward and say, if you want to give your life to Jesus, come forward right now. So we would do these human videos. And we did one on our high school campus at lunch. And I remember there were tons of people gathered around watching us do these human videos and asking, what the heck is going on? And kids would make fun of me. I was the, the kid in the Christian club that did all the crazy dramas, and I always had, like, Jesus Freak written on the back of my backpack, and I wore Christian T-shirts just all the time that said all kinds of, like, phrases to try to get my friends saved on them. And as the months went by, I personally got tired of getting made fun of. How many know getting made fun of is lame? It just, it stinks after a while. And I was... I was distraught because I, was, I began to get frustrated that every time I would try to take a stand on my high school campus, somebody would make fun of me. People didn't want to be my friend. Girls definitely didn't like me. <laughs> and I was like, dang, which actually my mom was probably happy about. Um, <laughs> but I was like, dang, man. Okay, so that... That conference in 98, you know, this last summer, that was awesome. But now I'm 16 years old. I'm in high school, and I'm, I'm bombed, man, because nobody likes me. My youth group friends don't like me. My high school friends don't like me. I feel like I got the raw end of the deal. How many of you come home from a Christian conference and you felt like that? You know what I'm talking about? You can be honest. Here is the reason why you feel like that. Here's the reason. It has nothing to do with your friends. It has nothing to do with your youth group. Your youth pastor does not need to repent. Here is the issue. The issue is that you have defined yourself by other people's opinions and not by what God says about you. If you will define your life by what God says about you versus what other people think about your life, you will go home and live radically different, I promise you. 
Because when you begin to see God differently, when you begin to go on a journey and say, what are his, what are his thoughts? What are his affections? What does he think? What does he feel? What, is, what does he think about my life? You get a confidence that no man can shake and no man can take away. Listen, your friends, you don't need to be their, their friend and go further down into dullness and darkness. You need to be the light of Jesus Christ that pulls them out of it into the light that you're currently walking in. You're not the one that's off. They are. Now that's a little bold. But it's true. We seem for some reason to always, we see it in testimonies all the time. We always have people come up and only give testimonies about I was in drugs, I was in sexual morality, I was doing X, Y, and Z, and now I feel a touch from God, and now I've moved on. Let me tell you something. The greatest testimony you can have is a heart that is set on fire by God, and that has not wavered one second throughout the course of your life. That is the greatest testimony because it is a testimony that Jesus Christ has sustained your heart your entire life. I want to see an army of young people that can testify and say, I never gave myself to drugs. I never gave myself to sexual immorality because I believed what God said about me was true. How many would love to have that be your testimony? I believe that what God says about my life is true and no other man, no other woman can define my life but him. I stand here after 28 years of going through the motions, Christianity, I can tell you this. I am loved by God. And if I don't do anything else with my life, I will be successful. Amen? I am loved and I love him. I'll tell you about the, uh, the, greatest, the greatest lesson my mom ever taught me. Parents have, you, all of your parents, you know, your parents have tons of wisdom. And honestly, sometimes you don't realize it until you're older. But you need to pay attention to some of the w pieces of wisdom your parents give you. I promise. Because it's from the heaven. God uses your parents to speak to your life. You need to listen to them. <clears throat> so I was 18. I just graduated high school. And... I had a lot of ambition about my life. I wanted to be a missionary that went to India. And I was so ambitious that I thought that I could go to India, start churches and like, uh, like medical facilities. I was going to get some doctors and nurses to come trained. And I was going to go to India and I was going to set India on fire for the gospel. And I figured I'd be done by the time I was 30. And then I was figuring, well, maybe then after India, I'll move on to like China or some other nation. But for now, I'll just focus on India. We'll get India set on fire for the gospel in 10 years, and then I'll move on to China. Like I was just, I was an ambitious little guy. Or a big guy. Still a big guy. <laughs> I was an ambitious big guy. <laughs> oh. And so... Graduated high school, and the questions came. All the questions that you're all going to face very shortly. What are you going to do with the rest of your life? And pastors wanted to sit me down for coffee. People were wanting to take me out for lunch. People were, had tons of opinions about what colleges, what seminaries, and what things I should do with my life. And I remember I... I uh, I just got frustrated. I got to this place where I thought when I turned 18, it was all going to fall into place for me. I thought that when I turned 18, I was going to step into my calling. God was going to use me, and I was going to know who I was, and I was going to set the world on fire for Jesus. That's what I thought. The problem was on the inside, I had no, no calling, no center, no focus for my heart. 
And so, I remember I went to, a, I, I was working at a meatpacking plant. Ironically, my boss is here tonight from that meatpacking plant. <laughs> a friend of mine, I was working for a friend of mine. And uh, I, I just never told the story with both my mom and my boss from the meatpacking plant in the same room. Um, <laughs> Hi, Donald Sins. So I was working for this meatpacking plant, and it's not that it was a bad job. It was just that I had thought I would be in India by now. Like, I thought I was going to be terrorizing through the country, just preaching the God at every corner. And instead, I was working in a meatpacking plant, working with meat until like 10, 11 o'clock in the morning. And it just, it hit me where I went, wait a second. I have no plan for what to do after this job. <laughs> I remember looking around at the guys and some of them had been there for 40, 50 years. God bless them. And I thought, oh man, is this going to be my job? Like, is this, is this the call for God on my life personally? Is, th is this what he's called me to? And I started to get really depressed because I thought I was going to be in India. I thought I was going to be changing the world. And so I remember I went to a family dinner that night at my mom's house. I was really tired. I was really frustrated. I don't think I talked much during dinner. I even did the dishes for my mom afterwards. I just decided to volunteer to do the dishes so I didn't have to retreat to the living room and talk. And uh, when, when I'm doing the dishes, I think my mom already knew something was up. Like the fact that I volunteered to do the dishes at 18, my mom was like, okay, what's going on with him? And so, uh, <laughs> so I'm doing the dishes. And I remember I'm just, I'm just frustrated. I'm just thinking about all of this. What am I doing? I'm 18 years old. Is there any plan? Is there any purpose for my life? And I remember my mom came in. She began to ask me. She, it was, moms have a way of doing this. How many of you guys know moms have a way of doing this? She's like, what's wrong? And the second she asks what's wrong, she doesn't have to ask anything else. You just break. Like, she's just like, so, Zach, what's the matter? And just, <laughs> I don't know who I am. I'm just, just instant weeping, instant bawling. And I'm just like, I don't know what I'm supposed to do with my life. I don't know who I am. I don't even know if God is right. I don't know anything. Anyway, so I'm weeping, crying. And uh, my mom comes in and she comes over. And I'll never forget this. She sits me down on the couch. And she lets me rant for like 30, 40 minutes. And I'm just like, well, I don't know. I think I want to help people. I want to be a teacher, a preacher. I want to, I want to like, I want to like serve, help those that can't help themselves. And I'm just rattling off all kinds of things that people tell you to say when you're in high school. And so I'm, I'm just rattling off all the phrases. And she looks at me. She says, Zach, here, listen, I want you to know something. She sits me down. She looks me in the eyes. And she says, Zach, I want you to know as your mother. I will be the proudest mother on the planet if you do nothing, if you work at McDonald's as a drive through window operator, I will be the happiest mom on the planet if you do one thing with your life. If you love Jesus with all of your heart, with all your soul, mind, and strength, and nothing else, I will be the happiest mom on the planet. I don't care about anything else that you do as long as you do that. And remember, it's stuck with me my entire life. There is nothing greater that we can do with our life, when we think about our life, than give ourselves to the pursuit of Jesus and the pursuit of his heart. There is nothing greater that we can do. There is nothing greater. Turn to Matthew 7. This has nothing to do with my notes. All the other notes are good, and maybe I'll get back to them. It's about the Father, heart of God. <laughs> really good. <clears throat> Thank you, Holy Spirit. <sighs> Power. Oh, come, Holy Spirit. Matthew chapter 7. Oh, <laughs> Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 through 23. Jesus ends the most powerful sermon on the, on, uh, in his ministry 
that he ever gave on the earth. And he ends it with this phrase. Many will come to me in that day, on that day of judgment. And many will say unto me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? In your name did we not cast out devils? In your name did we not do great works of ministry? Didn't we fulfill our calling well? And we, we started that business that we were supposed to. And we, you know, we fed the poor like you said. And we, we did all of those things. We did many wonderful works. And Jesus says, and this is the most cutting phrase in all of the Bible, if you ask me. He says, depart from me. I never knew you. You evildoer. Depart from me. Now, how many of you know that's an intense thing to say? That's an intense thing to say to somebody who's trying to do just the works of the ministry. But here is the issue. It's not about what we do on the outside that counts first. We've got it backwards. We think that if we do enough good things, if we get it right on the outside... Somehow we will please God's heart and he'll let us into eternity. Let me tell you, if you think that way, you will burn forever. If you think that way, you will burn forever. Here's truth. What you want to do is cultivate a fire on the inside of your heart. You cultivate a fire... That uh, a heart that is set ablaze with the love of Jesus Christ and it will rush over into your external calling and you will do the deeds that God told you to, but you will be doing it not to please men, but because you love and want to minister to his heart. The idea is not to have a great ministry. The idea is not to do lots of good things with your life. The idea is to love and pursue him with a fire and a passion where you know nothing but Jesus, love nothing but Jesus, and hate nothing but sin, and God will give you a ministry you can't dream of. God will give you a life that's better than you could have ever imagined. He will give you a heart that is more alive than you have ever could ever imagine. He will fix that aching, lonely pit in your stomach that you feel at night. And it's really easy to do it. It's really easy. Amen? We make it so complicated. Like there's 15 steps to being a follower of Jesus. There's 15 steps to being a Christian. And then we have the good Christians, and then the not-so-good Christians, and then the really-on-fire Christians, and the not-so-on-fire Christians. There's only one type of Christian. One that loves the Lord God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, and then those that are going to burn in hell. One type of person. Those that love Him on the inside and those that don't. There is no middle ground. If you think you can operate in between, you can't. It's a lie. Renounce it and love him. We think we can straddle the cares and the loves of this world and our love for God and we'll still be okay. You will burn. You can't do it. We think... That we can give ourselves to the pleasures of this life. That we can fix and mask our pain with entertainment. With relationships. That we can fix and mask our pain with drugs, with alcohol. Let me tell you, it's not fixing or masking. If you're doing those things, you're worshiping another God. There is only one God. You know how I know? People that have a drinking problem don't have a drinking problem. They have a worship problem. When they're they're happy, where do they go? To the bottle. When they're sad, where do they go? To the bottle. When they need advice and they don't know what to do with their life, where do they go? 
to the bottle. Where is their hope found? The bottle. If you're in a relationship with a boy or with a girl, and that relationship can be a place of worship for you. When you're frustrated and tired, do you obey Jesus or do you obey the boyfriend? Do you obey God or do you obey the boyfriend? When you need help, do you go to God or do you go to the boyfriend? Do you love Jesus with your heart or the boyfriend? Which one you can't serve two masters? It's either one or it's the other. Either you love Jesus with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, or you love something else and you will burn. That's an intense message. I wasn't even planning on being that intense right now. <laughs> I really wasn't. But we don't have time to mess around, amen? You don't have time to try to go back home and take the next 15 years to figure it out. Let me tell you, if it takes you 15 years, you're going to wake up and realize it's too late. You need to go home. You need to fix some of those relationships. You need to fix some of those things you're looking at. If your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It would be better to take out those things in your life that are keeping you from stumbling than to burn in hell forever is what Jesus says. Matthew 5. So how do we do it, Zach? Because that's... Uh, that's the question you all want to know after that, because it's what I want to know. How do we do it? How do we make this a reality in our hearts? Second Corinthians 3.18. Got some of my notes. Second Corinthians 3.18. <clears throat> we behold the glory of God being transformed in the same image from glory from one measure of glory to another measure of glory. We behold God and we are transformed into his image. What does that mean? Well, it means this. We say, Mike says it much simpler. What you behold, you become. If you're always looking at your problems, what are you going to become? Your problems. Amen? Amen? If you're always beholding your weakness, what are you go never going to get over? Your weakness. If you're always beholding your sin, what are you never going to get over? If you're always beholding your struggles, what are you never going to get over? Your struggles. But if you behold truth, if you behold the living God in all of his beauty, what are you going to become? You're going to become transformed into his image. Because let me tell you a little secret. All of you in this room right now, unless, unless we got anybody that's not saved, I'm assuming we got everybody in here saved, all of, in this, all of us in this room right now are completely free from sin, death, shame, fear, depression, and oppression. You don't need a service. You're already free. Lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power, Paul says. You're already free. What happens is we have to behold the living God in all of his glory. We're transformed. We remember who we are. And we're transformed into his likeness because that's who we were created to be. Think about it. Before the beginning of time, there was God the Father, God the Spirit, and God the Son. Dwelling in perfect unity with each other. God speaks, and He creates galaxies and nebulas, and creates the universe, and He creates the earth, and speaks mountain and water, and, and rushing waves, and animals, and insects. I'm still figuring that one out. Insects, and... All kinds of things on the planet. But then he does one of the most profound things in, in the entire Bible. He steps out of heaven. Everything else he speaks, but he steps out of heaven and he sticks his hands in the clay. And he begins to form Adam. Begins to form his body and his makeup. The first human begins to form him. 
And then he does something else. Instead of speaking, he reaches down and he breathes life into Adam. And he breathes life into his lungs. Let me tell you, do you know what Adam saw when he got filled with air and opened his eyes? He saw a father that loved him. He saw the delight of a creator that said, I find, I, we found a, someone that we can share our love with. He began to open his eyes. Adam opens his eyes and he gets the first breath in his body and he opens and he sees Jesus and he goes, oh my gosh. His eyes are like flames of fire. His face shines brighter than the brilliance of the sun. And he's smiling at me. How profound would your life be if you beheld that God? Because when you behold a God that delights in you, that has joy in your life, that is, that is pleased with you even amidst your stumblings. Let me tell you. Let me, get, let me, let me help you out. You're going to mess up. Amen? You are going to make mistakes. I mess up. Ask my wife. I make mistakes. <laughs> I do dumb things every now and then. It's, it's true. I'm a human like you. <laughs> we all need help, man. I need a lot of help. But it's not, about the, the, it's not about my weakness. It's not about the fact that I stumble. It's not about the fact that I need help. It's the fact that I know I can always run into the arms of a God that likes me, not one that just puts up with me. I know that I can always run into the arms of a God that likes me, not one that puts up with me. Let me tell you, if you want to be on fire in November, the key for you is to gaze at the living God and be transformed into his image. To be awakened into who he says you are. That's why we call this thing that's been breaking out at IHOP an awakening. Are people getting delivered? Yes. People are getting set free? Absolutely. But you know what's happening? What's happening is they're getting delivered because it's Colossians 3.10. They gaze on the image of God and they're transformed into his likeness. They put off the old man and they put back on the new man. And let me tell you, in a couple weeks, you know what you're going to have to do? You're going to have to be gazing at the image of God. So when the old man, those old sins that you struggled with in the past try to creep back up, I like to call it the dirty old man. That dirty old man likes to sneak around again. When he starts sneaking around, you put, you go and you behold God in his beauty. And you say, no, I am a son. I am a daughter of the most high God. And I will not struggle with that again. Amen. So. <laughs> it's 337. Uh, <clears throat> God is good. All the, time. <laughs> All the time. Does this help? Do you guys understand what I'm saying? Are you, are you listening? Are you, you, are you understanding? When we begin to gaze at God and who he is, we're transformed into his likeness. But listen. Here's the key. If all of your time is spent gazing at something else, you will be transformed into that likeness. If all you do is give yourself to movies and television, all you do is give yourself to frivolous conversations with your friends, and you know what, exactly what conversations I'm talking about. If all you do is give yourself to those things, you will be transformed into the dullness, into the darkness of those things, and you will forget who you are before heaven and need to be delivered yet again. And it's okay as long as you always know that you can always be delivered because you're not supposed to live bound up. You're free. I mean, my goodness. I mean, my goodness. For real. My goodness. I look at so many teenagers that are depressed and struggling with depression, and I laugh. Not because I'm laughing at them. I laugh because like, you have no idea 
who you are. You aren't depressed. No, that's a lie. It's a lie from the pit of hell. If you think you're depressed, let me tell you, that's a lie from Satan. You are not depressed, but you are free in the knowledge of the image of God, and you're going to live forever. It's not that serious. Knock it off. You're going to live forever. You're going to dwell in happiness and delight forever. You're not depressed. Knock it off. If you think it's cool to be depressed, that's dumb. I've struggled in my life with fear and anxiety. I told someone the other day, I, 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 was, uh, I woke up like two weeks ago in a panic. Felt like back in the old days when I used to struggle with anxiety. And I freaked out for a second. I went, oh my gosh, I'm just, I'm, yeah, I don't know if anybody's ever woke up in a panic, like just complete panic. But I woke up and was like, oh my gosh, I'm terrified. What's going on inside of me? About two or three seconds of panic, and all of a sudden it clicked. I was like, wait a second. No, absolutely not. You know why? Because I am a son of the Most High God, and nothing can touch me. My dad is coming back with the biggest stick he can find, and he's going to rip you to shreds, knock it off, and get out of here. Amen? I mean, think about it. Isaiah 9 says that it's zeal that consumes him at the end of the age. At the end of the age, when he returns to the earth, do you know why it's so bloody? You know why it's so, so filled with passion and there's so much wrath and people look at it and they get, they get thrown off by all of it? You know why? I'll tell you why. I'm a father. I have an 11th month year, 11 month year old little girl. Not year old. 11 month old. <laughs> I have an 11 month old year, uh, little girl. Her name's Natalie. She is the delight of my heart. And I mean, even this morning, like I just, I actually, it was a tender moment. She came and just laid her head on my chest this morning and just sat there for like 30, 40 minutes. Like she is just my little pride and joy. I love this little girl so much. <clears throat> and if anyone ever tried to mess with my daughter Natalie, or if anyone ever tried to lie to her, to tell her that I don't love her, what do you think I'm going to do about it? I'm going to fix the problem. <laughs> Let me tell you that when Jesus comes back at the end of the age, he's coming back with a sword to fix the problem. He looks at the forces of darkness and he looks at Satan and his lies. He looks at the wickedness that has taken over humanity and he says, listen, it's about time I'm a dad. I got a stick and you better believe that I'm going to chop off every head that I see because I'm a father. Stop messing with my kids. Amen. He says, I'm a father. Stop messing with my children. You have a God that fights for you. You have a God that will defend you. You have a God that will go to the greatest extent to make sure you know that he loves you. You know why? You know what the greatest extent was? It says in Isaiah 53 that it pleased the father to crush his son so that you could be free forever. He looked down at his son who he had known from eternity past for billions and billions and billions of years. Spent all of his life delighting in and he says, I'm going to kill my son to save their hearts. He goes to the greatest extent to make sure you know that you are sons and daughters. You better hold your head high. I don't want to see any depression on your face. Because you have a God that has paid for you, bought you, ransomed you. Never believe the lie again. Amen? Never believe the lie again. You are free right now. Here's why it's easy. You behold God, you go on a journey of seeking out his heart, of loving him, giving to him, 
fasting, praying, giving and serving to others. You go on a journey of living a life that is defined by those things and defined by what heaven says about you, nothing can touch you. You will go home and you will not just be on fire in November. You will be on fire in 30 years. If you believe this one truth, you will be on fire in 30 years. And save yourself so much time, so much hassle, bargaining with God about whether or not He loves you. How many of you are just tired of wondering whether or not God loves you in your weakness? Get over it. Let's, let's end the bargaining now. Let's end it today. Let's say, I am a son or a daughter of God, and anything that wants to lie to me or come and mess with me better look out because my dad is going to kick your butt. <laughs> Let's stand. If you want prayer right now, come on up front. Let's make a way for some people that want prayer. If you're saying, hey, I want to go home from this conference and I don't want to wait until October to realize that God loves me. I want power right now. I want to believe this right now. I want to gaze at him right now. And I want to know that I'm free. Come up here right now and let God speak to you. Let God speak to you right now. If you want him to speak to you, come up now. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Any youth leaders or anyone that's in the room that wants to pray, I ask you to pray for guys, for guys, girls, for girls. If you're struggling with this reality right now, here's what I want you to do. Hold out your hands. Close your eyes. Say, Father, I renounce the lie. Just say it to him. Father, I renounce the lie. If it's fear that you're struggling with, God, I renounce fear right now in the name of Jesus. Father, if, if it's depression right now, God, I renounce depression. I renounce suicidal thoughts. I renounce that I am not loved. I renounce homosexual thoughts. I renounce sexual immorality. I renounce those things because they are a lie and I am not bound to them. They are lies that you are not bound to. Renounce the lie right now. Come, Holy Spirit. Father, we renounce the lies that we are afflicted by the enemy when we have power on the inside to overcome that affliction. There's power on the inside to overcome because he loves you. Now I want you to do is I want you to release that into his heart. Father, I release. I release that pain, that affliction. I release that thing that I've struggled with. I release it back to where it came from. I release it back to the cross. And receive his grace, receive his mercy, his love right now. To say, Father, I receive it right now. I receive it right now. Come, Holy Spirit. Anyone that wants to pray for these ones, there's a ton up here. Nobody's really getting any prayer. If anyone wants to come down here and pray for them. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Father, we stand in agreement with your heart right now that you like us, that you love us, and we want to give the next year, the rest of the years of our life, knowing your thoughts and affections, knowing the depths of your heart. Some of you need to pledge right now. God, I pledge to give you the next 15 years to go on a journey to seek out your heart with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. To seek out your life. 
to seek out your thoughts and your affections, the emotions of your heart. God, I want to go on a journey to know what you think about me, how you feel about me. Let me be defined by heaven, not by what my friends say, not by what my weakness says about me, not by what the struggles I've had in the past say about me. What do you say about me? What does he say about your life? What does he say about your heart? Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Jesus. Come, Jesus. Come, Jesus. Release power in this room right now, God. Release power in this room. Stir up your zeal, Abba. Touch these hearts. Come, Jesus. Stir up your zeal, Jesus. 